Welcome back to Good Moms, Bad Choices. I'm Erica. And I'm Mila. And it's Wednesday, bitches. Happy motherfucking hump day. Happy hump day. How are you? I'm great. I feel good. I'm feeling like powered up for the for the first of the month, the last of this year. I'm ready to, you know, close this out strong and start again even stronger. I agree. This month's theme is Power Moves December because we are going into January feeling fucking powerful because this year has been, you know, it's done its thing. It's been great. It's been high. It's been low. But we always like to enter into the new year feeling activated. And I thought, what better way to start this month than with the guest we have here, who I am so excited. I'm so fucking excited to have her. She came all the way out to our little studio deep, deep in the valley and shit. Um, She's on a press tour for her incredible book. Uh, we have Jamel Hill. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate you having me here. I just feel... Um, Slightly nervous, actually. Nervous? Why? I'm nervous. I'm nervous. I am so nervous. No, because I told my mom you were coming. She's like, oh, Jamel. She's like, I might need to swing by. What time does it? <laughs> what time does it all record? I was like, Mom, don't fucking ring the doorbell, okay? I know it's, it's really rare that I like tell my family what's going on in my work because nobody cares. But I'm like, <laughs> this morning, nine a.m. Hey guys, just hi everyone. My hey grandma. <laughs> Not hey grandma. <laughs> I'm interviewing Jamel Hill today. Just thought I'd let you guys know that. All right, okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm nervous just because I listen to you guys all the time. You have a t- fantastic podcast and you're just like so lit and you're so interesting. And I, you just make me feel so damn boring. So that's all just like, ain't nothing boring I, about you. No, I'm like, man, okay. I, I'm going to come on there and, uh, you know, con- compared to the lives they live and the things they talk about. I was like, my old lame square head ass. Like, this is about <laughs> well, to ain't be. Ain't nothing lame. You are a fucking trailblazer. <laughs> right. Okay. For well, real. You. I for appreciate real. you saying that. Um, but no, I like your, your freeness, your boldness. Like these things are all um, attributes that very much inspire me. So I, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. And slightly nervous. <laughs> well, thank you. Don't be nervous. We're, we don't bite. <laughs> well, unless somebody asks just you to, nibble. right? Just nibble. nibble. Just, just a light bite. <laughs> um, well, welcome to the show. Um, we usually start off our show with an affirmation. This week's affirmation segment is brought to you by Target's Black Beyond Measure Initiative. Illuminating Intersectionality is a three-part video series hosted by our girls Fran of the Friend Zone, Dr. Takia, and Jade from Get and Grown Podcast. That's right. This series features dynamic discussions talking about identity, power, and honoring all the complexities of black womanhood. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to see if maybe you had one you wanted to share with our, our peoples. I, I do. Um, so the affirmation that I wanted to share, which is uh, is kind of central um, to me, and that is to, and obviously it coincides with what my podcast is named, it is to stay unbothered. And a lot of people, when I say the word unbothered, they think that that means like, not to give a fuck, but that's not what it means. It means to stop giving a fuck about the the wrong things, right? About the wrong energy, about um, the people who um, have tried to sabotage you, the people who are going to always talk shit about you, the people who are going to interrupt your flow with their negative energy. And so you have to stay in a space of being unbothered um, in order for you to really be your best self. You know, it's kind of like that old adage, you have to dance like nobody's watching. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of the mentality I try to use when, um, when approaching life, because if you start doing things based off how you feel people will react, you'll undermine yourself every time. So everybody out there, stay unbothered. Stay unbothered. So make sure you check out Illuminating Intersectionality wherever you watch YouTube and check out youtube.com slash loudspeakers network and check out our girls Jade, Fran, and Dr. Takia for some really incredible combos. When I think of unbothered, I think of like the emoji of the, the, the fingernails getting painted. Like <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think of. Like, sorry. <laughs> I mean, how have you like that? That that's a huge statement, and it, it seems small, but like even for you, I know you've come from like a very corporate background. You've done a lot of journal, like journalism. It's a very male dominated, white dominated industry and space, and like I'm sure you've had to. I know you've had to bite your tongue a lot and like stay in this space and probably to put up with a lot of opinions of people you didn't give a fuck about. Yep, and bite tongues, and I think that is really like that is a huge. 
a huge testimony because a bitch like me, I'd be like, listen, <laughs> I got some shit to say. Like, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> well, I, I think when you get into corporate America, especially corporate journalism, you kind of know what you are signing up for, that it is something you have to wager. Like, okay, on one end, there is this truth that needs to be told. Mm-hmm. On the other end, I'm dealing with the same white power structure that everybody else in every sector of corporate America that's black is is dealing with. And so... You just kind of have to decide that what you're there to do is worth more than the people sometimes that try to suppress what you're trying to do. So you fight a lot of battles. Uh, some of them you win and some of them you lose. But the whole point is that you're there to provide a certain amount of resistance. So even though I came from very traditional media, it was very instructive. It helped me develop and to, I think, to be the best journalist that I've ever been. And now that I'm in the season of really being in the business of my own brand of being an entrepreneur, everything that I was able to take and learn the lessons, the obstacles I've taken all of that. And now I've am using that as, um, you know, sort of the foundational training as I proceed with this season of me, if you will, it's me season. It's, it's me, me season. season. That's I'm right. bothered me. <laughs> um, tell us about that. Like, tell us about your journal, your journey. I know you're from Detroit mm-hmm. I, and I know you've done journalism. You yep. live in Connecticut. Like, how did you end up here in this space like, <laughs> with your own network? And like, you've come so far, man, it, it, this is not at all what was in the career plan. <laughs> you know, when I, when I first started in journalism, and my old ass has almost been in this business for 30 years, which is frightening to think about. Um, but I started when I was two. So, yeah, you know, it kind of makes sense. Ass. Yeah. <laughs> but I was I was very lucky to be one of those people who knew really early and really quickly what I wanted to do the rest of my life. So I knew in 10th grade that I wanted to be a sports journalist. And that's a very unusual dream to have for somebody who grew up in Detroit in the real hood, not the rap hood. <laughs> and so because of that. Um, you know, it just, I would never have imagined that somebody in my position would have the thoughts of doing this, but it was a couple of things. It was one. I love to write. I was a voracious reader. I love sports. And back then to keep up with your sports teams, you had to read the newspaper. So reading the newspaper, it clicked in my mind, like, Oh, people actually write about this shit for a living. Okay. So I joined my high school journalism, um, uh, staff and started writing for, for that. And, the professional paper in Detroit would publish the high school newspapers. So you had to go to a professional newsroom to get your newspaper published. So the first time I stepped into a professional newsroom, I was like, oh, I could do this shit. Like, Mm. I really like the energy, the vibe, you know, it was just a lot of electricity in the newsroom. And so ever since then, this is literally all I've ever done. I've had only two jobs that were not journalism related and they were more like seasonal shit. I deliver phone books. I know most of your audience listening is like, what the fuck is a phone book? <laughs> remember the yellow pages? I re- yeah, or the yellow pages, that, right? Yeah. That shit is not easy to carry. It's okay. Heavy, it's girl. heavy as hell. <laughs> but I was broke. And I was in college and what it was, they paid me 70 cents per book delivered. So I had to deliver a whole lot of fucking books <laughs> just to eat. You know what I'm saying? And um, I'll be slinging them shits everywhere too. Like that, that damn yellow pages might you know, wind up on your roof fucking around with me. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, like I did that. And then I worked at a snack counter at the W, uh, at the YMCA, which I don't know why anybody ever put me in charge of anything that involved math <laughs> and also me minding the store. Cause when my friends came in, I just gave them all Everything, the shit. Yeah, I, just, I mean, they got the hookup. I was like, why didn't the person who owned the snack store, why didn't it ever dawn on them that it was $6 in the drawer, but all the Cheetos are gone. <laughs> And like, what, this this ain't adding up. So I've been very fortunate to always have pretty much been a, a paid journalist my whole life. And, you know, the original dream I saw for myself was writing for Sports Illustrated because I was a writer. And um, that was the preeminent place for a sports writer is to write for Sports Illustrated. And I was like, if I could just make $50,000 a year, I would have made it. Mm. And so um, my second job out of college when I was making 47, I was like, oh, shit. And that taught me a lesson, which was, it's not that our dreams and goals are too high. It's that they're too low. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To think that that was just it. Mm-hmm. And I thought like, oh, I can retire after that is, is kind of crazy to me now looking at the life I, I lead. So being at ESPN was never on the vision board. Um, creating a podcast network for black women was never on the vision board. Being a podcaster 
or even do a television. None of that. All of those were things that happened um, based off adaptability. None of that was anything that I planned. But I think that's okay because, you know, uh, some of your greatest surprises come from when you make these kind of spur of the moment decisions that you have no idea that are about to be life changing. So thankfully I made some good ones <laughs> right? because otherwise, you know, this could have gone in a totally different direction, but yeah, that, that was sort of my pathway, I guess, to, to this point. But I, um, yeah, I mean, I worked in Detroit, Raleigh, Orlando, you know, lived in um, Bristol, Connecticut, where ESPN is headquartered for four and a half years, spent 12 years there. And being in L.A., I got here just because I wanted to get more into film and TV production. I was obviously podcasting. It's the first place, it's the first time I've ever picked where I wanted to live since mm. I became a professional. So I didn't want to fuck with any more snow. <laughs> I wanted to be in a big city, and I wanted to be able to throw a rock and hit a black person. That's all I needed. And I was like, I'm good. All right, because I'm sure in Connecticut it was few and far between. Yeah, I, I mean, they had a strong, believe it or not, they had a very strong West Indian com uh, uh, community, not in Bristol, in Hartford. Okay. So I lived in, in Hartford because, you know, in, living in Bristol, it's like, why? Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just it just feels very white. And me and a friend of mine, uh, my girl Carrie Champion, who also is an on-air personality, she, her and I laugh about this shit all the time. And she was like, you know when we hit rock bottom when we were in Bristol? And I was like, when? When we went in that bar and they had carpet. That's when it was, <laughs> we got to get out of here, girl. Was, she, was oh, like, no. she was like, they got carpet. And I was like, girl. Girl. We used to, I mean, no lie. Like, Bristol, it's hard to explain. Like, ESPN is in Bristol because it's cheap land. They get amazing tax breaks. And the founder of ESPN was from Hartford, which is 20 minutes from Bristol. So if you want to be on air every day, more than likely you have to live in Bristol, Connecticut, and you're in a profession where you go where the work is. The problem that is just, it just kills your spirit. <laughs> Not I'm ESPN, sure. but just living there. And we we laugh about this all the time because Carrie and I were there at the same time, although I did a longer bid because we call it a bid. Like, <laughs> I did a four and a half year stretch. And... <laughs> You know, we up in Ruby Tuesdays. Like I, eat, I'm eating shit in, in, in Connecticut. I would never eat elsewhere, right? No, no All shame, no disrespect. If you fuck with Ruby Tuesdays, because while you playing, <laughs> that black and tilapia is kind of everything, uh -uh, girl. <laughs> right? Tilap got, you can no listen, right? Uh -oh. No tilapia, no you're more. Not, you're anti girl. That ain't no real fish. <laughs> That is a lot of stuff farm raised uh, as fuck. Okay, what? that fish is that needs to be Pollock. extinct. <laughs> they are farm raising that fish. They're still making tilapias out here. <laughs> they're farm raising oh it. They're, they're doing some kind of genetically. I, did like, I don't trust it. I did like tilapia for a long but, time until I learned the things about. See, tilapia. that's why. I, that's why I don't educate myself about. <laughs> you food. shouldn't because it's I'm gonna like, fuck that's everything. Why I don't do it because I know you're all, only for a voracious reader on certain shit. <laughs> right? Only on the shit you want to know. <laughs> food is not the question. <laughs> don't ruin it for me. You know what I'm saying? It's like let something go kill me. Why can't it? be something delicious tilapia right? black and tilapia from that's Ruby right black and tilapia girl they from... trying to kill us <laughs> with the tilapia that's the first okay it's working <laughs> they've succeeded we had that go through some wood bridge chardonnay and thought we were like <laughs> i do like wood bridge chardonnay <laughs> you do? But, you, but, but tilapia no but right. wood bridge okay <laughs> selective class you know what i'm saying but uh no nah, that was life in bristol it's like a bunch of chains not a whole lot of flavor, <laughs> very white, very cold. And, um, you know, that was my life for four and a half years. So when I say I finally got a chance to, I was like, I can be in a city that has us, that is thriving and all this. I was like, I'll take these fucked up state income taxes. It's all good. <laughs> How long have you been in L.A.? Since 2018, um, me, he wasn't my husband then, but because we were uh, we were dating seriously and we were long distance. So we this LA is the first time we lived together. Okay, so he lived, in the he, same city, right? He lived here, and you were still no. He was in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Oh mm. wow! And then you were in Connecticut, and I was in Connecticticut. And then you guys both moved here and together. Then we both here, and moved. then you guys moved in together when you we came moved in, in together. And uh, he proposed two months later. Oh wow! Which oh, wow. was really Good shocking. To how, me. how long were you guys dating before he proposed? Uh, we had been we met in 2014 and got serious in 2015. So we had been dating about three years. Why were you surprised? Why was it shocking? Well, we had talked about marriage. We had had a ton of those, like, you know, if we get married or when we get married, we had had a lot of those, but just moving to a new city, a cross country move for both of us, thought we might need some time to just settle in and then just see how we felt about like living together. Like I, we had traveled so much together that I, I certainly didn't anticipate like, Oh, if he, 
leaves the cap off the toothpaste, I'm a fire on his ass. Like right. I didn't like I didn't think we were gonna have those kind of moments, but it's an adjustment, right? Right, and so, um, you know, I, again, I was I was really he he got me. He was he I was very stunned. So he proposed the the day after Christmas. Is marriage something you saw for your future? Like, were you like one of those little girls? Like, one day I'm going to oh, meet hell my no. Prince Charming and we <laughs> going to get married. No, not at all. <laughs> not with the marriages that were in my family, you know. Uh, like, my, my mother, my great aunt, and my grandmother, my great aunt and grandmother are, are no longer living. But between the three of them, they were married eight times. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Now, they was in them streets. So. <laughs> <laughs> not they was in the streets. R.I.P. Grandma and Great Aunt Jean. <laughs> yeah, I know y'all was out there. But, um, no, it just... Uh, and I saw a lot of disaster in terms of relationships. And my mother had very difficult, um, painful relationships with men. And I just did not want to make myself vulnerable in that way with another person. I mean, I certainly had serious relationships, but I was never the little girl thinking about the big wedding, thinking about Prince Charming or whatever. If I never got married, I would have been totally fine. Mm. So, um once I, you know, kind of got to a certain point, I actually was thinking like, oh, yeah, this will probably be it. And that's that's cool. You know, when I met my my husband, I think he was kind of actually on the same tip. But men always are. Right. Like they never, you know, <laughs> they maybe think about getting married, but it's never a central desire for them. So we kind of had the same mentality. And, um, you know, we we enjoyed each other's company. We had a great time. And I'm sure somewhere God was like, well, I got something for y'all two motherfuckers right here. <laughs> and then, you know, next thing you know, a, a great love was born. That's beautiful. Yeah. I, I was listening to um, your episode with Angela Rye. And um, she was talking about how out of the friend group, like, you're like, she's she's really proud of you because you're not always the most vulnerable and then this book that you have uphill which mm -hmm. congratulations Thank on you. this book y'all make sure you go check out Jamel's new book um you really kind of get vulnerable and you get really open in a way that no one's really ever been able to experience and dig into your childhood and really people get to understand why maybe it is you don't have that idea <laughs> of of marriage and and all those things and and even that your husband kind of has kind of pushed you in ways to be more vulnerable which I think is, which I think is often, it's so unique because I think women, we are usually the ones that are like, go to therapy, <laughs> like talk to me, <laughs> right. why don't you cry? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so, um, to have a partner that's been able to, to do that and, and just, and support you through this, this journey of, from, from being a little girl till now, I mean, obviously he didn't know you then, but I, I'm, I'm curious to know, like. Aside from, you know, you, you've had this amazing career and I'm sure maybe you've been offered book deals in the past. Um, why now? Like why? What propels you to want to write this book and really and really get deep? The money. <laughs> Y'all think I'm joking. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Uh, uh, good what, answer. Honestly, that was I didn't want to write a memoir. Mm -hmm. uh, I did see myself as an author. I want to be a fiction writer. Mm. That was safer. That's, that's safer. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, you're right. I mean, yeah. and maybe that's part of my not being able to be vulnerable. It's like, oh, I can create a world and some of that world might be drawn off my own personal experiences, but nobody will ever know what that is. Right. And so I'm not exposing myself in the same way. And, you know, essentially my literary uh, agent told me that there was tremendous interest in hearing my story. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of shocking to me. And I know people are like, why would that be shocking? Well, you know, just because people may know me for, being at ESPN or know me for what I said about Donald Trump or, or whatever, that doesn't mean they want to know the full story. Um, but he's like, no, there's going to be a lot of interest. And there was, and he, once the book went to auction, that's when several publishers bid on um, the rights to your book. And he said, listen, this is a good way for you to accomplish that other dream you want to do, which is to be a fiction writer. Like get this book out there let people, you know, hear from you, know your story. They'll, They'll be invested in who you are and it'll be that much easier for you to take that next jump. And once I decided um, that, OK, yeah, this is a good pathway and the money's good. Mm -hmm. So why not? Um, I'm not the type of person I don't jump in shit halfway. So I'm like, listen, I'm looking at this as like a, a one shot deal in terms of writing a memoir. So I got to lay it all out there. And I know that when, sometimes when people read 
celebrity memoirs, they feel like they pulled their punches or they feel like, mm, I don't think they were being totally like, true. Like generic. Yeah. That they're just maybe trying to make themselves look good and all of this. And then I'm willing to expose certain things that have happened to them or to be honest. And I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that to people, you know, because certainly as a journalist, transparency, truth, those are things that are core principles of what I do. So I just decided here's what it is. And what's funny is, I'm not good in terms of vulnerability person to person, getting better, work in progress, but writing, being vulnerable in writing has never been hard. Mm. And I don't know why that is something to ask my therapist. Shout out to you, <laughs> Dr. Streeter. Um, but yeah, just from the, you know, I write a lot about how I kept journals as a kid and maybe it's because it was my first original safe space is being able to write down how I felt no matter you know, how fucked up it was or, you know, whatever it may be, knowing that it was a space of no judgment writing. That's mm -hmm. what it is. And so it wasn't actually that hard for me to reveal some of the things that I did. Now, if you sat me down in an interview, it might be different. Or if you're one of my friends, because my friends were reading this book and they didn't know a lot of shit that was in here. They're, they're like, like, girl, uh, they're like, bitch, you lived a whole nother life. I was like, I did. I did. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, it just, it, it wasn't as tough from that standpoint. The toughest part about writing this was all the conversations I had with my mom because, you know, we have, she has her own personal trauma, which then became shared trauma, you know, as somebody who's, um, was molested as a child and then suffered a, a very horrific rape, sharing some of those things. Uh, or asking him about asking her about those things. That was the tough part because, uh, you know, with her addiction and everything, I'm literally asking her about the worst moments of her life right. and having to put them into print. And so that part was tough. But actually, the decision to share and open up in this way, it wasn't as hard as as people might think. You guys have been hitting us, asking us so many questions about the Good Vibe Retreat. So we thought we'd take a minute and just fill you in so you get all the details that you need to know. The question that a lot of people ask us is, what is the Good Vibe Retreat and why did we start it? So the Good Vibe Retreat is a retreat for women to come, relax, let go, release, and kind of step away from their normal scheduled routine, get to know women from all over the world, and really tap in and back into yourself. It's an opportunity to reinvent yourself, essentially. You don't know a lot of these women, so there's really no one there to judge you. So you can kind of create this new version of yourself, step into what it feels like to be yourself when you're not feeling judged, when you're not feeling pressured, when you're really in the most feminine and divine space to really do the work on yourself. For sure. I mean, I think as women, we do so much shit for other people on a regular daily basis. We're at work, we're momming, we're girlfriending, we're wifing. And um, a lot of times we get lost in the sauce and we forget to take a step back and really hone in on who we are and who we want to be and what that looks like. Um, and just kind of a place to get away from this fucking rat race and ground down with nature and with women and with yourself, most importantly. Treat yourself pamper yourself, be pampered, get super relaxed. And um, honestly, just take time for yourself without the input of anybody else. We also really recreated this retreat because we wanted to make something where you really didn't have to think about anything. We've literally done all the work for you. All you really have to do is just show up. Buy a plane ticket and show up. Everything else is taken care of. We've literally taken care of transportation. You'll be receiving gourmet meals every day. Um, all of the activities, we even have add-on activities like psilocybin experiences. We have natal chart readings, massage, excursions, beach trips, um, you don't have to smoke weed, but we got that too if you need it. Um, you don't have to come with a friend. This is an experience that we encourage you to come even alone. You can bring a friend, but most of the women come alone. And also, a lot of people are asking, like, do you have to be a mom? I know we are good moms, bad choices, but no. This is about being a woman first. This is about leaving those kids back home and doing you. So even if you don't have kids, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how old you are. We've had women from as young as 20 and as, as old as 60. We also, you don't have to be black or 
brown. There's no race that is not invited to the Good Vibe Retreat. Everyone is accepted. Um, as long as you're there to be open to the process and try something new, then you're invited to the Good Vibe Retreat. Um, a lot of people ask us, where is the retreat? So this retreat in particular is happening in February. So we have two different dates. The first is February 2nd through the 7th. And the second date is February 11th, 11th through the 16th. It's just going to be this beautiful, magical experience that you really couldn't recreate in this place by yourself. We've really tapped into the community of local healers and and people out there that we've trust and that we've also experienced and wanted to bring to you to experience. It happens in on the Caribbean side of Costa Rica in a town called Puerto Viejo. It's a really small town with such a beautiful and rich community. Food is good. People are kind. Music is good. The weather is warm. Um, it's really a magical, magical place. The jungle is a magical place. It's very, it feels like a, like a warm mother's hug, honestly. It just feels like a deep exhale. Um, not only that, your girls, us, well, we will be there, yours truly. We um, have designed and host a connect workshop that's designed to kind of kind of get to the nitty gritty and, and help you um, let down just boundaries and walls that we create and kind of get vulnerable and free. Yeah, and connect to women that maybe you may have never or would have never said hello to in any other in any other time or way. So it's really about making new friends and everyone is there with the same intention, which is to connect back to themselves and possibly make a new friend. And if you're there for that reason, then you're going to leave feeling so fulfilled and so happy that you came. I encourage you to go check out our reviews on We Travel. You can get real life reviews there from um, our former guests and former attendees to see their experiences and hear about their experiences. It is truly, truly a magical, magical experience. If you're looking to learn how to manifest, if you're looking to tap into yourself, if you're looking to just relax, if you're looking for your new tribe of women and friends and support, this is the place to come and experience the Good Vibe Retreat. We get a lot of questions, too, about the, the rooming situation. And first of all, the property that we take over, we take over the entire property. So it's just us here. Um, so it's very, very private. You can do anything you want, whether you want a skinny dip, you want to do cartwheels in the morning, whatever it is that you want to do. You want to light a joint, walk through the property, roll up to yoga with your joint. Like, that's totally cool. Um the rooms are double occupancy, so we have a, we have a bunch of different options. So you can either share a room with someone. You each have your own bed. If you're traveling with a, a, a best friend or, say, you want to save a few dollars, we have a room where you guys can share um, a large bed. We also have the option to for you to stay in your own room by yourself. So you have different options. When you check out the link on We Travel, you can see what these different options are, but the accommodations are really beautiful, really tasteful, really roomy as well. You have your own bathroom, you have your own patio, and this boutique hotel is nestled in the black beaches of Playa Negra, which is this beautiful, beautiful part of Puerto Viejo that feels like it feels like you're kind of nestled in away from the world. And that's why I love it so much because you really kind of have to tap out and really tap into yourself when you're in these when you're in this space and you're in um, at this property. We also get a lot of questions about uh, payments. So, do you have to pay all at once? The answer is no. You do not. Um, you can put down a five hundred dollar deposit to hold your spot, and you can make payments up until basically the retreat. Basically, yeah. Um, not only that, it's really helpful that you can get contributions from friends and family. There's a link where people can contribute to your trip. Christmas is about to come up, so don't be shy. Ask your friends and family to contribute and like really give you a gift that matters and that you really want. I'm just really excited for this retreat. Every single group that we've had has been so divine. Um, each person that was there was meant to be there. And when I say women come one way and leave another, I just, there's nothing like it. I've seen such transformations on this retreat, as well as us as retreat leaders and people that, women that have also experienced um, the retreat and 
these facilitators of the retreat. So I really, really want to encourage you to take this time for yourself because you deserve it. You've been thinking about it. You've been thinking about when am I going to have a break? When am I going to be able to do something for myself? This is it. You have the time to really invest in yourself and what an amazing investment. I mean, we've really created and curated this incredible itinerary, really, really dedicated to nurturing and taking care of you. And think of it this way. If you go on any other vacation, you're going to spend way more. You're going to have to think about shit. And you're not going to come back with a hell of a lot of new friends. So don't think twice about it. Don't overthink it. It's way worth it. And I'm not saying it because I created it. I'm saying it because I've heard it time and time and time again. You guys know if you've gone on vacation ever, you spent a shit ton of money. You don't come back with any meaningful relationships or friendships and experiences really. So um, take a leap of faith, invest in yourself, invest in your relaxation and come join us in Costa Rica. I can't wait to meet you. I was just curious about like, I'm curious about that, too, because me and Mila, uh, we just turned in our book a few months ago that's coming out next year. And, you know, feeling like, you know, you're talking about other people, too, and like, <laughs> you're sharing your truth about situations mm-hmm. that maybe are not their truths. Um, and, and even with your mother, I mean, interviewing her and really in her having to be a core part of the storyline because mm-hmm. she is um, like was she open to that? Was she was she scared to share or was she ready to share? And- I think she was ready. Mm. She was very ready to share because um, she really felt like her testimony, our shared testimony, could help somebody. Mm. And these are the a lot of the things she that I discuss in the book and the incidents. Those are things that, you know, most of which we have talked about throughout, you know, our relationship. And. But there were a lot of things I did not know, you know, at all. And uh, because some of the things happened when I was in college, you know, I did not know, for example, that my mother first tried heroin when she was 11. I had no idea until I talked to her about it this for this book, which, you know, kind of one of the takeaways that I want people to have is that you need to have these conversations with your people with your parents, you know, like ask them about their shit. Mm -hmm. They have lived entire lives before you, before you came into the picture. Um, They've had disappointments, fears, failures that you don't even know about. And I think it helps you give them grace and it helps you see them as a full person. It, yeah, it humanizes them in it so many It humanizes them so much. Because if not, I mean, especially like if, if, you're, if your parent has been a drug user your entire life, you might look at them as like, you didn't show up for me in this way. I hate you. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. But when you really understand why it is and for your mother, um, if you don't mind me sharing, I mean, yeah, I'm going to book. But mm-hmm. I know that she was molested by her uncle mm-hmm. for many, many years. And mm-hmm. her mother didn't believe her yep. or chose not to believe her and then moved him in yeah. to live with them. And that's what and that's when she ran away from home. And that's when she tried heroin. Right. So it's like then you start to see how the dots connect. Like, mm-hmm. OK, so you were a you were a survivor. You suffered one of the worst betrayals that a daughter or a child could suffer is that when their parent in the worst moment of their life doesn't take their side doesn't support them and even worse tells the rest of the family she's a liar right and then it it just set into motion their relationship being complicated and turbulent the love was definitely there but that betrayal is one that never healed you know, never did even up, up until my grandmother's last breath. It never, never healed. And so once um, I understood that part of it, like I, I knew about the uncle. I knew about what my grandmother did, did not know, as I said, about when um, she first, you know, experimented with hard drugs. And then once she told me that, I was like, oh, now I see what the through line was, is that you've been self-medicating. For a long time, because that was your only refuge. And it just, as much as I'd forgiven my mother years ago, um, and there wasn't a whole lot to forgive, because the one thing that I admire about my mother is that she's always been accountable about it. And even at the height of her, um, you know, usage, if she was, if she was going to do some shit, she would tell me she was doing it. Right. right? And so there was never any surprises, mm. so to speak. And because of that, that is what made that capacity 
for forgiveness to be as broad as it was. Because I, I think most people, what really keeps that resentment going, especially toward a parent, is when they don't own their well, shit. Not, I was going to say they're not accountable. When they're not accountable, that just that sets the that sets the conversation and the relationship off in a different manner. And so because my grandmother was never accountable, that is why their relationship was as fractured as it was, even though my mother, you know, she never abandoned my grandmother. She was her caretaker, especially when her health got really bad. And only maybe once in her life did she live more than 15 minutes away from my grandmother. But there was, um, you know, but when they fought, they fought. And it was bad. Mm -hmm. And I was caught in the middle sometimes. And so that would be a tough position for me to be in. But, you know, this is why such a a powerful theme in my memoirs is just about how that generational trauma just can just really eat up the inside of a family. Mm. Shout out to your mom for, like, having the bravery and the wherewithal to not only be accountable, but then be like, yeah, actually, you can't, you should write about it. I think it's time to write about it because, like, I think especially as black people, I we come from long lines of secrets, mm. and uh, that's our business. You don't t- you don't go out and tell our business to that's our right. family What business. happens in this house you know, stays, stays in this in house. house. Yep. <laughs> and, you know, growing up under the under that, like, scope, it's it's just, it's, it's subconsciously built in you, and you, and you literally feel feel guilt about telling the truth and it until and, in, and even in adulthood it's a it, it takes a lot to undo that that not that curse but it is a curse but you also have to think about like how deeply it's seated mm-hmm. and like where it comes from and just like having parent a parent to be like and you should write it and I'm gonna sit down with you and tell and tell you about it from my perspective is so powerful and I think like even for Erica and I I didn't realize how powerful it was for me to just like come talk about shit. You know, like we've had a, f- a four years of ver- like vocal journal, you know, and it's been so therapeutic talking about it and talking about it. And then same, like even this book that we're really like writing, like writing it and l- releasing it and like letting it go. And it really does. It really does like heal generational curses. It's really like putting shit into the light and letting people learn and, and, and be like, oh, damn, I'm not the only one. Like, oh, my mom also didn't believe me or this happened to me in my family. And like. And I think I was going to ask you, like, it's one thing to write about something and then, you know, walk away from it. But how how did you think you were going to feel once it was published versus how do you feel now that it's published? Because I think even though you know what powerful moves you're making, I think sometimes it's like, even for me, my book hasn't even come out yet. And I'm sometimes I'm like at night, like, oh, shit, like it's coming out. There's nothing I could do, you know, but like, because I think there is like embarrassment, you know, like, damn, like people are going to know my life people are going to know where i came from people are going to know the dark secrets of when in reality it's human shit people are going through shit and you're like the woman you are as 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 imp- like powerful as you are because you've been through these things and you've had these experiences but i think sometimes we we're we shy away from that and just want to show people like the product and not all that's happened up until that point you know so like how has it felt now that it's out people can purchase it and read your words so intimately yeah, it, it's a it's still a little unsettling because depending on I guess what people knew me for and at what phase in my life, it, like I was used to at ESPN, people coming up and asking me sports questions, right? Because that's they saw me on ESPN, so naturally. And then even after all the controversy with Donald Trump happened, I was used to people coming up to me like, "Let's talk about this racism." I was like, "Yep, let's talk about it." <laughs> and it's white privilege. Okay, let's go. So, but those are things that there's a level of cognitive dissonance for me because that's not about my real life right. it's just like I'm just, oh, yeah it's not personal I'm just pontificating on some shit yep the Jets yep yep they yeah, shit them. Yep. right exactly <laughs> racism yeah, <laughs> right. yeah exactly. racism like, can you believe these white people like yes I, like those are different but now and I remember uh, Gabrielle Union uh, is a friend of mine she told me this when she wrote her first memoir because she had exp- you know has shared the fact that she suffered a, tra- a traumatic rape um all these women who read it were coming up constantly sharing their rape stories. Mm. And I was like, girl, like, how did you? It's heavy. That's so heavy, right? And you want to comfort, but at the same time, you have to protect your own mental space. And so that's the part that I'm still kind of bracing myself for because um, I'm happy that people who know people in their lives who had to suffer um, with addictions and even if, 
they had to navigate around somebody else's abuse or even having been sexually abused, all of those things. I'm glad you can relate to the material at the same time. I'm, I'm concerned at the end of this of if people are doing the same thing, like what, what mental impact will that have on me so far? It hasn't been that most people have been like, Oh, I was really inspired. You know, they say a few words, but, I, and then just being uh, bracing yourself for being asked about it because again, it's the one thing to write it. Another thing to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I, I, I guess to answer your question, I still don't know. I, I feel fine today, but I got three more cities to go through. <laughs> <laughs> well, you so, got three more cities and a, and a, and a, and a lifelong it's always of, in print, of, yeah. Of books and people coming to you, and yeah. I mean, it it is because and 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 they will, they will come, yes. and they will sh- they will want to share, and you will have to protect yourself in ways. Mm-hmm. And and I know even for us, sometimes like people share so we we are always sharing, and then people come to us and share such intimate parts of their lives, and I and I'm like, am I giving good advice to you? Like <laughs> I don't right. like, am I supporting you? Like what happens after this? Are you okay after this? I'm thinking about them like later on in my day. Like God, is she okay? I don't even know her like <laughs> she all right no that's a real thing you know and, yeah because and even not just about my reaction you know my mother and I we did red table talk and it was overwhelmingly a positive reaction for sure but you know I just hope as she because she lives in Michigan still and I just hope when she's just going about her daily life that people are rolling up to her and being like, oh, you know, tell me about that time you did crack. Like, <laughs> right, you know what I'm saying? Right, it's just right. like, being gentle. To, right. Yeah, because they're not, because sometimes people, when they see you out there in the public eye, they feel like it gives them license to say certain things to you. Like, I'm used to being in the public eye. She, you know, Denise is not, you know right. what I'm saying? So I don't know, you know, how she's going to handle some of that or even, um, you know, being more in the limelight and having such a very complex story being told and absorbed right in 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 the public so um we're just learning as we go so this is definitely uh, a very different sort of chapter than what i'm used to in terms of of being in the public eye in this way Mm. well i think gosh your mom sounds like an incredible human i mean she's gone through a lot yeah (laughs) <laughs> she's gone through a lot and she she's here and, and look what she's birthed, you know, and she's giving you this gift too of like transparency and honesty that like you said, so many people they don't they do not get. And, you know, I think that that's there's something to that. There's something really magical to that and even being able to now speak it out loud i i i I would be interested to know how you feel in like six months i would too all the the talking because like really i i really believe and advocate for i think speaking and you know in therapy too like speaking really is healing Mm -hmm. and the more you have to talk about something the more you are able to release it and i know you've already forgiven your mother but there's probably other things in this book that you maybe still are like working through and way in a lot of ways definitely that you know, in six months, you might be like, yeah, you know, I'm cool now. I'm good with that. <laughs> well, and then, you know, realize that not everybody got to see this book. And it's, um, mm. you know, uh, before it was finalized. My mother, she read it. My husband read it. Um, my publicist read it. <laughs> and some of us, some very select friends. But, like, my dad just got it. Like, he didn't get it until after it was done. Did he read it? He did. And did, did he have opinions? He did, which he shared on Facebook. Not on oh, Facebook. No. And um, <laughs> they love old people love Facebook. They sure do. That's their diary, bitch. <laughs> and we have not had a conversation about it. Mm. So that that's so gonna, you just saw it on Facebook, and he never. Con- I heard about it on okay. Facebook because my uh, my mother let me know, <laughs> and she was not happy mm-hmm. about. And I don't. I don't even. I never read what he posted, so I have no clue. Um, I don't know what how he feels about it, but. However he feels about it, he should have called me. Right. And so I'm very curious as to how that phone call is going to go. Yeah, I mean, should people have, you know, you have to meet people where they're at, you know, and and or not meet them at all. There's that. That's too. a word. Yeah, that, <laughs> that is a word. Yeah, you know? I, I didn't feel obligated uh, to, you know, call every single person that was mentioned and say, hey, just so you know, uh, the people who, because, and I know you guys probably went through the same thing, is that, because you're sharing your story, you wind up sharing other people's story too. So I was very sensitive to the fact that I wasn't trying to tell anybody else's story. Right. So 
you know, that's why when I uh, talked about having an abortion in the book, I didn't give the real name of, of the guy that it was. Because I don't know if he's actually told that story right. mm. to anybody. And, you know, to me, even though we have not spoken in probably more than a decade, it would be you know, kind of grimy of me to just like throw his name out there. And Terrence. Then, yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and be like, by the way, you know. Not being his name though. I know. know. It's not. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Edit it out. <laughs> I know, right? I was like, that's not his name. You ain't even close. Don't even worry about it. So, but, you know, I was just being sensitive to that. And, and while, yeah, there are other exes in the book who I use their full name, but like nothing outside of regular relationship happened um, regular relationship shit happened between us. So I didn't feel like, oh, I got to tell him about that time your ass didn't put the milk up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right, like, right. I didn't have to do that. But you you do have to be, you know, really careful about that with relationships you actually want to maintain yeah. and have. You know, some of the people mentioned, like, I don't give a fuck. So it really didn't matter. Yeah. Right, honestly. I'm, I mean, honestly, to be honest, I didn't check it with really anybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I, I have been, I was mindful about like making sure that this was my, my testimony and I'm not oversharing things that don't really have any relevance to. And, and I had to, my editor was like, okay, so I think you need to scale back. This is not important. Oh, really? I was like, this is my diary. This motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I, at least, look, my first draft was 400 pages. Girl, ours was, was really yeah. long what was, too. I didn't even know I was capable of writing this many pages. I was like, how many pages? <laughs> No. And then I was like, you need to eliminate 100 pages. I was like, how? <laughs> it's my life, bitch. <laughs> but I think that's good that you, you put everything in the kitchen sink. Like, that's what you do. You put everything in, and then that's how the story starts to form. Like, I put it all in, and then as I got some notes back, they didn't tell me 100 pages. They were like, this could be, you know, just more cohesive. And I was like, okay. But I, I started to see the story. I started to see the beginning, middle, end. So, but you... To me, you only get there is if you put everything in and then you can start to arrange the puzzle pieces so that this all fits into something that, again, is 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 very cohesive. So I think it's perfectly fine to overwrite. Sorry, book editors out I there. Know. <laughs> I know. I, uh, I, I was listening to your story about how your mom... Um, went through all your journal Oof. and I had a, I had a very similar situation really? growing up. I journaled all the time. It was like my, my safe space journaling, journaling. I have like 50 fucking journals from my childhood. I don't know what the fuck I was talking about. <laughs> you but, still have them? Yes. Okay. I still um, have some of lots too. of hate speech towards my parents, but <laughs> um, I, I had more than one occasion when they read, they read my shit and I remember it being <gasps> so fucking like, I felt so right. violated and it really fucked up my relationship with writing. Mm. Like I, there was a point where I literally created a language that <laughs> I still remember. Like literally I have a code, like I can write in this language cause I was that paranoid about people reading my shit. Cause I was writing so like personally and, it, and there's a time where I stopped writing. So I felt like when we got this opportunity to write this book, you know, like time constraints, checks are being written. They're like, you, you guys need a ghostwriter? And I was like, no, <laughs> I must write my own story. But I realized, like, it, there was a block, you know, like, from being violated that way from my parents. Like, that 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 avenue of, like, therapy that I had, you know, invested so much in as a child, I felt like I couldn't trust it anymore. And it was, like, writing this book was, like, a way of getting past that and, like, getting personal again. Because there was a time where I felt like, bitch, don't be too honest in this shit now. Right. <laughs> Remember what happened last time, bitch? You can't now, be did they, once they read it, I assume they confronted you with the information? Oh, girl. Girl, I was writing about like my lesbian lifestyle. I was like, I want to be a lesbian now. I want an eighth grade. And they're like, you're not a lesbian. <laughs> you're not a lesbian. I'm like, I'm not a lesbian. <laughs> what? I, I think at one point I was like at a, a ca like a Christian school. My mom must have kicked me. And I wrote about it. And child, the, the Christians and took my journal. They called child services to the oh, house. No. What? Yes, the child services came. And I was like, she didn't kick me. I lied. <laughs> I was like, bitch, you kicked me. <laughs> Bitch, I, I know you remember. And they're like, you better, you want to go to, you want to go to adoption services? I was like, no, mom. I'm sorry. It was very traumatic, you know. But yeah, I don't like, think parents realize like what a mark that leaves because I, I had it happen to me twice. Once my mother, when she read it, and I say in the book what happened as a result. And then I, I had an ex that did that mm, that read it. I had an ex too, and, and that, that shit hurt me. Woo! That was something else. And the thing that really pissed me off about it was the, the ex read it 
didn't tell me he read it, but used everything in there to sort of weaponize the situation. Oh, like, 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 because he, he then had insight he knew, to what hurt Because he, he had insight, and he also, um, you know, there was some information in there about, you know, somebody at, at one point that I had messed around with, and I never told him about it because, you know, some men, they get a little... It's not your goddamn business. There's right. that part. Well, they get insecure. <laughs> they get insecure. That's why I didn't tell them. And I was just like, I'm not going to tell them. Because me and the dude, we were just just friends. Right. right? And, um, you know, it, it just happened one night. Um, and uh, I we were because we were still friends, I was like, I don't want to make this weird. Because if I tell them, he you don't have an attitude. You don't have an attitude. Every time I, just, I hang out. I just don't really it. feel like going through all that. And I, but, and I think his position would have been, you got to end, end and the friendship, the friendship right? right? And so I was like, I ain't even try to go through all that. Right. So I was like, I just won't say anything. And so he knew it, and he kept pressing me constantly because I had written he, about he him. Wanted my, he honest. wanted me to be honest. And I was like, why does he, he keep Why does he keep asking? Asking? No, right? And then he And then he finally told me that he knew – yeah, like he was on some just super secretive or not super secretive, some like extra manipulative narcissistic shit. Mm. So he knew he knew I had he I had slept with this dude and he kept asking me about it, knowing I wasn't going to tell the truth about it. Right. So he already he's already setting me up. <laughs> then, <laughs> then he goes, oh, this is how I know you're lying. And then he said, because he said the guy that I slept with had been telling people. And that's and how, and it got back to him. Manipulated oh, so, na- so now you're a hoe and everybody knows. No, so right. Like, so now I got to curse him So he out. completely <laughs> lied about and how he, he found it and out. And then you admitted. And no, no, well, then I did. <laughs> but then I called the guy and went in on him. And I was like, like, how the, he was like, and he told me then, he was like, I just want to let you, he's like, fine, we don't, we don't ever have to talk again. It's all good. You know, whatever, whatever. But I just want you to know your man is lying to you. I never said a word to anybody. He's lying. And I was like, because I couldn't think of how else he would have known. And I was like, no, nah, you probably lied. So we totally fell out about it mm. or whatever. And then finally, one day we were having a conversation. And, um, you know, he said, I, he said something like, you know, tell me something I don't know about you or whatever, or tell me something you've been wanting to tell me. Like, we just having a conversation. I don't even remember what I told him. And I asked, turned the question on him, and he was like, I read your diary before. Oh, and I was like, motherfucker. I was like, what? Whoa. And I'm thinking he going to tell me, like, you know, I, I snuck a cinnamon roll when I told you I wasn't. Like, <laughs> right, something, something right. trivial. I was like, what? And so he tells me this, and then it all clicks. It's like a beautiful mind when he's at the chalkboard and all the shit starts went, clicking together. And I'm like, ain't this so. Bitch. Mm. And when I tell you I was heated, <laughs> I was so angry because I was like, okay, so not only did you violate my privacy, you then weaponized the information and manipulated the situation just to get me to stop being friends with this dude who's friend. Like, I just, I blew up. To ruin this, a relationship. To, right. Like, and you were lying from the beginning because, you you know, I was, right, because you were insecure. And I'm not saying that. I was right for lying to begin to begin with. Like I should have just told him the truth. And then if he would have said like, Oh, you have to stop being friends with this guy. Then we just would have had to just deal with that, which would have been a no, but we just would have had to deal with it. Right. So, okay, whatever. But for you to just create and concoct this situation, I was like, I blew up at him. And it's the only time that I've ever been in a relationship where I, where I swung on a dude. Ooh. The only time. And because because of that. So I have very traumatic experiences. Because you know what? It, it's like, it, it's bigger than that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I realized like, it's, it's like a physical safe space, but really it is like, it symbolizes feeling safe. Because like, no, you didn't have to tell him you slept with your friend. I, right. It's not you. It's right. like, now you know, so now I feel bad I didn't tell you. But my therapist told me something because she said that her husband like called himself reading her diary because I was telling her about this childhood experience that fucked me up and she was like I told my husband the version of me that you get is this version because I get to write that stuff down now if you go look at it and you go look at that version of me that's on you I was like write this down damn that's (laughs) like that's good (laughs) I was like now if you get that ugly version that's on you because this is I write that down so I can get be this version of your wife and I was like whoa she's right you can you have to write the shit down to get it out and that could be ugly and and dark and all these things and the secrets that no one's supposed to know but I realize is that like 
as it's like a it's like a symbolism like as black women you like think of the relationships you've been in you didn't tell him because you knew he was insecure right you didn't tell him because you knew he couldn't under he couldn't take that truth and then still honor and love you and support you and a lot of times we feel we 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 and we feel that energy and so we lie and we hide ourselves and and then we don't feel like we can express ourselves and then we're not vulnerable because we feel we don't feel safe enough to do that because we haven't been put in scenarios in households in families that have supported us in ways that say you could be dark and ugly over there that's okay that's a part of the experience and get it out and write it down and in fact it's like that didn't happen i'm not apologizing throw that shit away don't don't talk about it don't think about it don't speak about it don't write about it and then you're just stuck with all of these feelings of a not feeling safe not even in yourself that like damn why am i doing this why did i hoe out like that why do i have these feelings and you don't feel safe expressing them and getting them off and like i think that's the like the play of like a lot of black girls growing up, like you don't feel safe anywhere, right. not in your family, not in your household, not in your relationships. And I didn't realize how, like once you can feel like, <sighs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay here. Oh, you're not going to, you're not going to leave me. You're not going to beat me. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? You still want to be my mama. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like then you can finally like deal with all of the, all of the childhood shit, all of the darkness, all the things like, damn, am I like this? Or am I like this? Because my mom was like this to me. And is she like this? Because her mom was like this to her. And why is her mom like this to her? And you can sit with all those feelings and sort them out. But it's not until we're like, we really feel safe enough in our own bodies and our own selves and our own families and support systems to do that, that things become clear and then we can become this version of ourselves to have platforms and be like, bitch, it took me five years to get this shit out to be like, I'm, I'm working on myself. You know right. what I mean? Like Eric and I friendship is like, has really grown in our podcast because this is like my first friend and we both grew up in the Valley and the majority of my friends here are white. And I, as I got older, I'm like, oh, we're having differences. We, oh, you don't see this the same way as me because you don't get it, bitch. Oh, you have a daughter and you have, and now you're a single mom and you feel like a baby mama. And like, I felt safe enough to be honest about where I was at and how I was feeling and like have this friendship that has, has really made me feel safe enough to show up as I am. Like, yeah, you might not like it, but fuck it. I have a friend who supports me and I feel safe here. So I'm allowed to, to speak my truth. And even though it's scary still, I'm allowed to be vulnerable it's given me strength to be vulnerable and to be like imperfect mm-hmm. so it's just like uh, sorry like went down a deep no no what i think about when i'm listening to this and to and to both of you is like how it vulnerability although it can be extremely uncomfortable and and you know i think in ways i'm still working through my own level of being totally vulnerable as well but it becomes a superpower it really mm-hmm. is a superpower and it's how we all kind of connect to one another. It's how we even understand our boundaries, even like you don't really know your boundaries until you kind of are honest about shit and honest about what you need to do. And like, you know, people don't like boundaries. And and also when (laughs) when you look back on how the opposite, uh, like festers in your families, when you look back on your family history, I look back on my mom who's, done crazy shit but she's like you know we don't tell nobody i'm like bitch this is the problem <laughs> right you know like when you see how it festers and how it manifests in our parents and their parents and how angry like my, my, my grandma is i'm like what the fuck are you so angry about but like all these th- it's because you haven't felt safe enough to express yourself and be vulnerable and be soft and like i'm just thankful as like black women you know, especially with like your network, Unbothered Network, you are literally creating a space for black women to unapologetically show up and be like, this is a safe space for you. And how powerful it is when you put other black, you, yourself, other black women in the position for other black women to hear it and be like, oh, I can do that too. I can mm-hmm. relate. It is some powerful shit that's, that's taking place because that hasn't been the privilege of most of our lives. It's taken these like weird turns, you know, like, speaking your truth and then like like no bitch corporate's not for you this is for you right and making this making this space is for you and like it's just it's so interesting how even when fucked up things happen to us when you can tap into the vulnerability and tap into your truth how pivotal it could be because like you said i'm sure you didn't expect to be podcasting and like writing a book based on your personal memoir and you're like very happy in fucking you know journalism where it's surface and it's not personal at all but how transformative it's been when you're able to dig deeper and like be honest and show all the layers of you yeah i'm being exposed is actually a good thing 
Um, and I, I've said this before about about marriage, or at least about my marriage. I obviously can't speak for everybody else's. Is that one of the reasons it was like the best thing I've ever done is because it did force me to expose myself. And I've been in so many relationships where I only had to show versions. Mm. This was the first relationship I was in where I had to show everything, and it was very frightening. It Why was, was that? What yeah. Was what different? did he? How did he challenge you in that way? Well, because I I think the way that he is, like he's a very um, like direct person if he if something is bothering him he just he says what it is uh he over communicates and so he's <laughs> he's very and he likes that because he's he um he's a type of person that if he doesn't handle something a certain way it, it, he cannot rest you know like, what's so, his birthday he's a leo uh. august 6th <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> so uh you know, you know that Leo energy. They got to get it off their chest. They, they got to get it off their chest right then. I was like, you don't have to do it every time. <laughs> it's okay to save some for later. <laughs> and I'm the opposite where something will happen. It might, it'll bother me. And I was like, let me think about this for a second. Like I'm strategizing how I want to approach something. Or I decide maybe it's not really worth mentioning at, at all. And by him being as out front as he was, I have to at least meet him halfway. Mm. So he's demanding something of me emotionally. And to be honest, most of the men I had been with had never put a demand on me. I was largely in control of those relationships. Um, and so this one was the first one where there was a level I had to actually step up to step up to. And I was like, Oh shit, this is different. Right? <laughs> I was like, Damn, I was you like, really making me. I kind of got to bring like my A game. Oh, oh, okay. I can't just be, you know, kind of uh, just turning in an average performance here. I had to like really do something. Dig deep. I had to dig deep. And, and he's somebody, he asked a lot of questions, you know, because he's curious and he wanted to, and, and that for me was always a turn on it. Cause I'm sure you guys have been on dates before. They won't ask you shit about your life at all. They will tell you everything about theirs and won't ask you nothing. One. Like, I'm dope as fuck. Don't you want to know? Right. Aren't you curious? <laughs> like, you know, no. and that just to me gives a red flag of you really aren't you really don't even care to know me as as a person regardless of how this turns out i mean it could just be a relationship it could just be a flirt it could be something else just something physical but that means that you really don't honestly give a shit about knowing anything about me but he was never that way and so um because of that uh it it just forced me to be much more transparent than i was used to being Plus, he's, like, very secure in who he is. I also wasn't totally used to that either. And it took a little bit, even after we got married, for me to to trust that security. I mean, I saw it. But when you've gone through situations where it hasn't been there, you're like, Dude, can I really? Is this real? Let me try. Let me, let me, let me, let me throw. Let me see. Yeah. Let me just little degrees. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, but, no, it, it just, it marriage really exposes, uh, exposes you because the, that person is getting to know you on a totally different level than anybody else. I mean, you're, you know, you're living it together, doing everything together. And, you know, it was a pandemic where we locked down or is a pandemic, but during lockdown, like we are up under each other and getting to, to get to the core of some stuff. So, um, yeah, it it can be pretty frightening, uh, at times for me because I'm just like, Oh, I'm not used to, to doing this. And I think one day he had like said something that he just meant as an offhand comment, but it bothered me. Now, normally I would have just kind of blown it off um, or just thought about it for a while. Like, uh, when do I want to bring this up or how? But I took a step out of the room because I had to do something in another room. And then I thought about it. And then I just reversed course and went back and be like, Hey, when you just said that, like that really hurt my feelings. It hurt my feelings. It bothered me. What were you, what did you mean by that? And then he told me and I was like, "Oh, okay, I misread that." And he was like, "See, that's the value." And then he wanted to turn it into a teachable moment. I was like, "Anybody ask you all <laughs> that?" <laughs> He's like, "But that is why." He's like, "I want you to share with me so that if you do have a um misunderstanding or something or just to open you know, kind of the lines. You don't of have to internalize it like you've I had don't. to do your yeah, whole life. Yeah, I'm an internalizer. Oh, yeah. girl, I will like shut down. Like, I don't want to talk anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I'm done with that. I won't. I, I won't necessarily shut down, but I'll internalize and be thinking about it without um, communicating. Without what communicating you're it and without really dealing with it. So it'll be in some lock box somewhere deep in my soul, bothering you, but not bothering, but not me. being. But then you know, it's it's also bad because if that person who may have done something that I didn't like or I should have addressed, then when they do something 
you know, small, uh, like forget to hold the door open for me or something. And when I lose my shit, they're like, where did this come from? Because I hadn't. Two years ago when you said that thing. Remember that time? Yeah. Like, no, bitch, I don't because you didn't say shit. Exactly. (laughs) No, I don't. I don't don't remember that. So I have tried to um, get out of the habit of doing that because that's how you wind up totally disintegrating relationships. Cause I'm like, if I give a shit about working on the relationship, that means I have to be able to share these things and not let shit like fester mm-hmm. and grow like resentful. I think also for you, like, like, like being in corporate, being around a lot of white males and like probably navigating very powerfully in your, in, in your career, you know, it is, it is a, like, it, it's interesting how you can like navigate so powerful in your career and all these other things. And then when it comes to a relationship, the struggle is be vulnerable, bitch. And you're like, <gasps> Oh, I can do everything, but those are so yeah. hard. You know? but it's, it's so costly for black people to do that. And I think because we do often have to be in, in spaces where we have to code switch, where we have to minimize, where we have to shrink, that we would be naive to think that did not carry over into our real personal lives yeah. and our real relationships. Like, of course it does. Because Absolutely. we're forced to be in that mode probably 18 hours a day, you know, most of us. So, um, it it becomes uh, like such a terrible habit to try to break, and, and it, it irritates me too. So many people are like, I hear on the internet, it's like, oh, you know, black women are so masculine. You know, like you know the reason you're in this position because you so you masculine. You want to be the the man and the woman. It's like, no, nigga, I've had to. Oh, right, right. <laughs> this no, is not a nigga, choice. It's not a fault. I've had yeah. to survive. Like, we're, right. yeah. niggas, a lot of you didn't show up. Yeah, right. I wish I could wear my flowy dress in the garden. <laughs> right, like I'm being a delicate woman. You know, like this whole like this. We had an episode with Daphne called "The Return of the Soft Woman," and like. You know, and I, I, I feel soft in ways, but sometimes I'm like, girl, it's not, it don't work that way. You know what I mean? And like, even having to reprogram myself, like, you know, like you do deserve marriage. You do deserve to have like a supportive partner. You do deserve to show up delicate and soft and shit, you know? Cause like I find myself, even with my daughter, like I'm, I, I am a, like a sweet mom, but sometimes I'm like, girl, no, I'm like, get the fuck up stop like and she's seven and I'm like bitch this is your mother and I'm like and your grandmother but this is what I'm conditioned to like you know not like bitch but like girl I'm not with all the bullshit I'll talk to her like that like I'm not don't play with me with the bullshit get up let's go Mm -hmm. and I'm like and I've been around some of my white friends and they're like you can't say that I'm like yes I can (laughs) you know what I mean but like having to remind myself to be soft with myself to be gentle even with my boyfriend like yeah. Please get me some soda. <laughs> He's like, I'm like, nigga, give me some soda. <laughs> but it's hard though to to break that because, you know, I think for so long it, it is it, one of the byproducts of everything is does go back to slavery. It does um, slavery and just of the trauma we suffered as a people. We have often parented our kids. Um, for a harsh world by being harsher than the world. Mm, protect right. in, in yeah. ways yeah. to protect them. Yeah, yes. let me get you'll get this here right. first. We, let me get you know because let if me, you do this on, on the field, you, you this is might be punishable by death. Correct. Yeah. I might not ever see you. Correct. So it is. So it's I, like we get really, really harsh. And, you know, my mother, like one of the of the many things she apologized for was uh, some of you know some of the beatings she gave me because it would be over a lot of times it would be over little shit losing a barrette or you know kid shit kid shit like shit that kids do. normally would do like not being quiet or being restless that's what kids typically do and you know uh, there's a generation of parents that will fuck you up over that and and that's the beginning of losing your voice that's the yes. beginning of of thinking I can't I can't express myself don't cry boys don't cry you better, you better suck. what you crying for because girls crying. get told that shit too, too. too. Like, yeah. you, you literally can't cry because it's not a good enough reason and I think being black there's like there's so much survival that requi- that's required that a lot of times it's like yeah suck those fucking tears up but when you're a child that's not like that doesn't sustain a, a safety space and so Mm-mm. you're going into the world not feeling safe and you get those like you're, that innocence taken away from you you're not using your voice you're shutting down you're not using your feelings and then you become grown ass women who can navigate in the workspace but it's hard to have a husband who want to you want to get married and love you and you're like uh, relax <laughs> <laughs> relax with the love babe it's it, a bit much that loss of agency though is something really important because I think that was you know for me as as a child that was the the, the emotion that was difficult is that it just the lo- I just didn't have any agency and so I hated that feeling and 
um, of the many wonderful things I discovered in, in therapy. Cause I, I start the book saying that how, and it is a true story, how I, um, started going to therapy on a dare because my mother kept telling me I was angry, which only made me angry. Cause I'm like, I ain't angry. <laughs> All right. But it wasn't that. But when, once I started going to therapy, what I discovered was that I was a control freak mm -hmm. and I did not know this about myself, but then I just started to unpack it a little bit. And what happened was because of that sense of not having any agency, I went out of my way to overcorrect that as I you know, grew into adulthood and beyond. And that's why my career has been such a primary focus for me and making sure I did the right things, got the right internships, followed a certain path. I was very regimented about what I did because I wanted to be sure if I, I can't control shit else, I'm going to be able to control this. I know if that if I put this particular, um, you know, effort into it, I know what the result will be. I can count on that. Mm. I can't count on people out here, but I can count on this giving me you know, what I need. And, you know, I, I, I didn't discover that until like four years ago. So I was like, damn, I've been fucked up this whole time. <laughs> I've been man. trying to control all the shit because I didn't, I didn't even know Because I'm not that really that way with like personal relationships, but definitely about my professional life. Like I can, I can just get very anxiety filled and very like, oh, I got to know, like, how is this going to pan out? Like just, um, which is not really, uh, not really cohesive with, kind of the laid back spirit I generally have. I, I think it's probably like, it's funny how shit happens for a reason and like how when you are looking to heal and to grow, like God will put things in your way and it's like, no bitch, you got to examine this. Mm. You, know, you can't just keep functioning in this way. And I, I can even imagine for you, like having this very successful career as a sports journalist, working at ESPN and then saying something that you feel like is in, within the, your full freedom right. of speech. You're like, <laughs> no, this is my job, bitch. And then they're like, nope. Too comfortable, huh? you know what I mean? <laughs> right. and, and feeling like, even feeling triggered by that in ways because you have, yeah, you've done everything you've right. You've done all the things and you've worked your way up and you've, and you, and you are, and you're like an amazing sports journalist and you've done all the things and then they're like, nope. And they're like, what the fuck, bitch? You know what I mean? And I can, I only imagine how that can shake up this little girl who's who's put all these things in place and controlled all these things and gotten to this point and now you're like what do you mean it's still not it's still not solid there are still ways and ways you can like shake up my whole shit and take things away from under my feet and i and i like i'm i'm sure now you're in ways grateful for that shift oh definitely i mean as you said is that uh you know god does put things in front of you that he wants you to dig deeper on and it was what I realized after all the fallout from the Trump stuff is that I had gotten complacent mm -hmm. in my career to some degree. I programmed it to such a degree, but I'd gotten complacent in it at the same time because once you're at a place like ESPN, it's a destination place. You know, people want to end their careers there and retire. Say, I've been there. Yeah, I've been there 15, Especially 20 Especially as a woman, a black yeah, woman, that's huge. Like, you know, it's it's the equivalent of when... You hear black folks say, got that good government job. It's right. like literally. You got same. benefits, girl. You got benefits, <laughs> right. All of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I had other dreams for myself, other things I wanted to accomplish, but I was content with just, you know, running out my contract and just like, oh, I'll just wait till this whole ESPN thing is over. And then I'll get to some of the things I really want to do. And that's such a dangerous mindset. Because you get comfortable. Because you get comfortable and you're making the presumption of time. Which mm -hmm. if there's anything we know, you cannot make that presumption at all. And once all of that happened and I realized after, um, you know, I got suspended for a couple of weeks that my relationship with ESPN was untenable at that point. I started to plot my steps on out of there. Because I was like, yeah, we... we I think even in a personal relationship, sometimes you reach a point um, where, you know, you you know when the, the last straw has has happened. Y'all might even still wind up being together for a couple extra months, but you know. Just like that story I told you about my ex reading my, my diary. I was just like, oh, I knew it was after that. I was like, oh, this shit is done. Um, and it, it was just like, okay, I, I know this is the end, but yet how is... I got to plot out how we do end or mm -hmm. like how it ends. And that's a, and that, and that, and that again, well, that is a testimony to that, that, that way of thinking of way, how you plan things out, right. even, even out of that. And that's, and that's amazing that you were able to do that. And I think now that you have unbothered the unbothered network and 
you don't have to tiptoe around shit. Because mm-hmm. right? I think as women, we have to tiptoe. In relationships, we tiptoe around. Even when we know, like, this shit is over. I'm, I'm going to tiptoe around this shit. Same with, like, in corporate America, tiptoeing around and in the space that you're in. And, and the beauty of podcasting. And is, and I think podcasting is getting more corporate now. We have you know, brand sponsorships. All this. There's, a, there's a level of tiptoeing. But there's still a real level of freedom. Uh, absolutely. That I'm sure that you've probably never really experienced in your workspace. No, I mean, this is... I mean, it, it, it was, it's kind of a, a, a weird position. Um, but looking at, say, Spotify with the Joe Rogan situation, mm. right? I don't fuck with Joe Rogan. Like, I don't even know Joe Rogan, right? right? I don't fuck with him right. based off what I do know, right. right? But all that being said, the same rules that apply to him apply to me. We're on the same platform. Right. We're both exclusives to Spotify. And they have never once called me and said, hey, don't say that. Right. Like, that's never happened. Right. And so, as much as I detest some of the things that Joe Rogan says and how I do think his platform is so big and he says such stupid things, like that's for that's for him to worry about. But because he has the license to say stupid things, so do I. Right. Right. And so you're, it's sort of what what works. It works for both of us in a in a weird way, and it does feel good to not have to feel like I have to be so. Um, you know, corporate or so, but, you know, uh, kind of buttoned up, yeah. you know, for a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people that listen to my podcast, they had never heard me cursing like that before. And I was like, Oh no, I get <laughs> like, it oh, in. Cursing. I know. Right. I was like, I get it in. You know what I'm saying? So, um, and I think also in like, in, in spaces like in corporate, like black women that have opinions are always talk. They always label us as outspoken, right? Aggressive. Yes. No, it's the outspoken, it's the outspoken thing. Thing. And it's like, yeah. I'm just honest. <laughs> Why yeah, does it have it to be outspoken? Because the, the word implies that you're doing something extra. Yeah, right? like right. that you're wa- you're ra- a little reckless. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's teetering. It's giving that a little and it's bit. Like, no, no, actually, just, I'm very just... intentional with what I said, and actually, I meant everything I said in that tweet. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you had to hit him with the per my last email. <laughs> what I had said, and so yeah, you're. I mean, you're you're so right about that. Is we often get that you know, label of outspoken or And I we've even angry. labeled ourselves as that. And I've mm-hmm. been thinking about that. I mean, I don't even know if it says that anymore. I think I took it off. But like, why? Like, yeah. why? Cause we're, like you it, said, because you're, you're just being honest. Yeah. I'm speaking at all? Because yeah. <laughs> I'm speaking, and, I'm And outspoken. I will say that men are some, there's some men that are they, out there that get labeled that way. But I think it's generally women. It is. And especially mm-hmm. if you're black or brown, yes. like for sure, outspoken, rec- a little reckless, mm-hmm. wild. Yeah. Risque. Yeah. Saucy. Like, it's just, yeah. yeah it, it doesn't I know they mean it as a compliment, but sometimes it comes off like they um, you know, they feel like we're just being extra, you know. Yeah, I'm just unbothered. <laughs> I'm just unbothered. Yeah, I like and the timing so, of that. And speaking of unbothered, I just want to say I'm so I'm so excited you have our girls, the Black yes. Girl Bravado. Yes, there. they are uh, Brittany and Germany are, Shout out to Brittany and Germany. They are amazing. Yes. And um yeah, you you all what appealed to me about both of you all's uh podcast is like you have that homegirl energy but that realness and so with a with a with a tinge of ratchet <laughs> Guys, just, a little ratchet. just a little sprinkle of it I'm like okay you know and so it's um yeah like they're they're gonna be great I'm so happy that they are now being exposed to an entirely new audience and you know they're our, they're our first podcast that appeared on the network and um our second one our first original is sanctified which um Think of, you know, all the that same those same qualities and, and characteristics, uh, but talking about shit that happens in the church. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. So it's, it's like a spin- that's, that's necessary. Oh, it's very necessary. So there I mean, how black women worship in, in, in this time is really interesting because I, I think there's a, a generation of us. Maybe it's, you know, I am older than you guys, but maybe it's like our twin generations of not really feeling like you have a place in the church Mm. because look at you looking at a church body. That's usually dominated by women. All the leadership is men. Mm -hmm. That's why they still talking about that purity and chastity shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And so they're meeting stuff like that, like head on about where black women fit about how we're choosing to define our relationship with God for ourselves. So it's, it's really, really dope. And, um, I'm just happy you know, these are the kinds of products I wanted to put out on the network that um, gave black women a sense of belonging and a sense of place, regardless of, of where you are, whatever station that you are are in life. And I'm not saying I know 100 percent down who black women are because we're evolving and we're complicated. But this is, to me is at least a step 
and giving us, um, you know, an opportunity to explore ourselves beyond the whole savior trope, um, mule trope, like those kind of things. It's like we this whole idea that we got to run into the burning building for everybody else. That's like, fuck that. Sometimes we got to let that bitch burn down. Mm, we pick, we pick <laughs> yeah. flowers, bitch. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm back there picking I'm flowers. I'm going to call 911. Right. That's, that's, <laughs> I'm, that's it. I'm Karen. I'm Hello. Called. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. When they showing up. I don't know. I can't They'll help be you. here. But I tell you what, my black ass ain't running up in there. So <laughs> I wanted us to feel comfortable doing that. Comfortable putting ourselves first. And that's, kind of what this network is supposed to represent well thank you thank you for being you know the the change that we need to see (laughs) we appreciate that like we do need more spaces to be as versatile as we want to and and kind of give permission to black women that you don't have to just fit into this box it can look like this and it can look like this like jamel or erica or Brittany in germany and like you can take a a teaspoon of all of it and mix that (laughs) shit up and we can come together even in our differences and even in our growth and our dissection of ourselves and our like our liberation in ways because i like like the veil is being removed for us and women are like oh look at her she's oh she's over there doing that let me see what that looks like you know what I mean and like just having different versions of black women and having a platform like that is is really dope so thank you well thank you so you know I'm dying to know what the hell does this card mean? Okay, well I'm ready to tell you. Are you? Because I I've just been staring at it, like trying to decipher okay, so what the picture is. At the top of the show, Jamel pulled the world card. Yes, shout, shout out to Mahogany Tarot, our our black cards that we love. Mm. If it says some shit like you got 24 hours to live, you can just no, keep that. No, no, <laughs> the tarot don't be talking like that. <laughs> it's a tr- it's like a, a interpretation, but I think I think okay. you're gonna fuck with this one. Mm. It means upright. It means completion, integration, mm. accomplishment, travel. Mm. Mm. Um, when the world card appears in a tarot reading, you are glowing with a sense of wholeness, achievement, fulfillment, and completion. A long term project, period of study, relationship, or career has come to full circle. That is scary. And you are <laughs> and you are now reveling in the sense of closure and accomplishment. This card could represent graduation, a marriage, the birth of a child, that's also a birth of a child, or achieving a long term dream or aspiration. You have finally accomplished your goal or purpose, everything has come together, and you are in the right place doing the right thing, achieving what you have envisioned. You feel whole and complete. The card invites you to reflect on your journey, honor your achievements, and tune into your spiritual lessons. Celebrate your success and bask in the joy of having brought your goals to fruition. All the triumphs and tribulations along your path have made you into a strong, wise, more experienced person you are now. Express gratitude for you, for what you have created and harvested. Finally, make sure you don't rush into the next big project. Ooh. Celebrating your journey will set you up for success when you are ready for the next challenge. I got goosebumps for you, girl. Girl, <laughs> wow. Okay, seriously. Um, that's a good word because I definitely tend to jump from one thing to another. So maybe I'll try to take a beat as much as a book allows you to take a beat. Um, <laughs> I will take that under advisement. But what a what a word, man. Okay, yes. all right. The world, I see you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I know you're ending your book tour in Detroit, so make sure you have a good, fun old time there. Have a little party, <laughs> celebrate maybe a strip club. <laughs> maybe maybe a strip club uh, maybe. in Detroit. Yeah, yeah, I mean that is you know a therapeutic place for me. I love going to the strip. Me club. too. You do? Yeah. Oh, we should all go one day. Yeah. There's we no good have, ones here. Yeah, we're gonna have to like go out. We're gonna have to like go to Atlanta yeah. or something. I see. I thought that was just me. No. I didn't want to diss LA strip clubs. No, they're terrible. Like, they're okay. horrible. All right. Trash. I'm glad it's. I'm glad it's not just me. The ones in Detroit. Well, if we ever find each other in, in a city where strip clubs are popping like Jamel meet me at Magic City <laughs> I've had a blast up in Magic yes. City before so we got wings come on we down. got wings and yet I have never had the wings what I have not had the wings I've been there to of course put some um, lovely young women through college yes <laughs> uh, but I've never actually had the wings so uh, I think the last time I was in there might have been New Year's Eve a few years ago. So me and my husband went and had a good time. It's time. It's I think it's that time you know again. What? The it's couple that can go to the strip club together stays together. <laughs> there you go. Amen. That, that's my marital advice. That's a, <laughs> we're to gonna ask on. you marital advice. Oh, we're we were going to ask you. Okay. Go to the strip club with your husband. <laughs> okay, oh, I like that. I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> no, I mean honestly though, if I gave some uh advice for uh and I, I have figured this out. Um you have to design the marriage that's that's best for you. Mm. You cannot you may admire the happiness another couple has, but you have no idea the kind of diagram they had to and blueprint they had to create for themselves to have that success. There's like no one size fits all. Like 
you know, there, I mean, you guys have had talked about this on, on your, your podcast before about, you know, people engage in like open marriages. That might be what works for them. It mm-hmm. keeps them together and happy. It doesn't necessarily work for me, but I understand that everybody has to custom their marriage to what works. And I become, I think when I was, you know, sort of single, I was way more judgmental about how people's marriages operated. Because you thought you had an idea of what it's supposed yeah, to look like. Yeah, because yeah, I, I think we all go into it how we think it might work. And then once you get inside your own, and to be honest, once um, a lot of my married friends start opening up more about their marriage, once I got in the club, you know, so when we had a little secret meetings. It was like, oh, what? Y'all do that? Okay. All right. And so... Yeah, just don't go into it thinking that it has to be custom designed a certain way because something there there in every marriage there's something truly unique that works for works for them that would never, never work, work for somebody some, else. Right, right. That's so advice. yeah, and also keep you know I mean I know we spent a lot of this time talking about how it can be destructive the whole everything that happens in this house stays in this house but everything that happens <laughs> in your marriage. Let it stay, stay in, in there. there. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Because everyone will have an opinion. They will have an opinion. And not only that, is that you want to provide a layer of pr- pr- protection around around your marriage. So yes. you can't let everybody into what's happening into your house. For, for sure, too many opinions can cloud the mind. And yeah. Like some shit don't need. Yeah, yeah so just don't I, even need to I be. I think there's that. And also there is this level of sacredness. It's this special, yes. beautiful thing that only you guys share mm-hmm. and no yeah. one else has. It's not even about whether someone's going to ruin it. It's almost mm-hmm. just about how beautiful that is. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so before we leave. Wait, no, speaking of relations. I know, I'm not. Okay. I'm okay. getting into it. <laughs> like, don't I'm not, forget, I'm not very important. to leave without this. <laughs> Because I thought we were going to bypass this, but then she said she was ready for this. I was ready for this. <laughs> she came prepared. Okay? But then you guys ru- you, you guys ruined it because then you started No, don't, don't, okay, no, 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 Don't even worry about that. Right. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, is it hopes. good enough? Does it's it reach good. the threshold? <laughs> It's like, what's the last porn scenario I saw? Let me, let me just, just lie a little. Let me just lie so a little. I was in the elevator and it got stuck, right? <laughs> Every porn. So one time, this mailman. <laughs> well, the pizza so, got delivered late. <laughs> so now it's time for our, my favorite segment, Horror Stories. This is featuring Jamel Hill. <laughs> oh, this is, I mean, by the way, brilliant segment idea. One of those, I was like, God, why did I think about that? <laughs> so as right now, my publicist is watching over there in a look of slight horror like <laughs> what are you about like, to say no, she's there smiling she can't wait she like what is it yeah, i know <laughs> couple of disclaimers <laughs> all right one this is when i was single long 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 time ago all right <laughs> this is probably at least a good the story is is it yes yeah, i think it's over 20 years old okay. like 20 ish i should i should say that so um <laughs> When I was leaving a job, some of my coworkers decided to throw me this amazing party. And I was like, ooh, this is my last hurrah. This party is going to be everything, yada, yada, yada. So one of my girls in uh, that I was working with, she had been messing around with this dude, like, off and on, who... To be honest, was kind of community, and y'all know what I mean about like I'm community. I'm familiar with community. Yes, yes, yes. We yes. Know the he was, was kind of community, <laughs> and even though she did, she she started to develop feelings for community, and oh, you, know you never that. do you that. You do that. never develop feelings, feelings for, for community. community, right? But so she throws me this awesome party at her house or whatever, and I mean it's like thick. It's like a good old fashioned house party. We in there drinking. We having a good old time. So I see community. And me and community would flirt, right? That's so, what you do. That's what you do, because it's community, right? <laughs> so at the same party, I had invited, like, another dude that I, I, I like, liked. And, uh, you know, he worked at, like, a local bank. He was cool. He was, like, a couple years younger than me. I was like, he, you know. I mean, I'm just, like, in my early 20s, so it's just, like, whatever. So he's just like, you know, what you got up later for the night or whatever. And I'm like, well, we had a party, but, you know, shit, we can get into something after this. So I... <laughs> I gave him the key to my apartment and told him to go wait. <laughs> right? You're a pimp. You're a pimp. Go home and I wait. Mean, I'll, be, I'll be home in a little bit, baby. Real. I just did this for real. So um, he goes to my apartment where he is waiting. So I was like, oop, got a situation at home, already waiting or whatever. <laughs> Meanwhile, me and community are like vibing. And I'm just like, this is so surprising, you know, whatever. <laughs> so community and I have a rendezvous at the party. And I completely forgot <laughs> <laughs> but the dude that I told to wait in my apartment oh. or whatever, because me and um, me and community went in the bathroom in the party, and you know, 
did what community what you do with community community, <laughs> <Of course>. community <laughs> things did community things and you know i'm having a good old time or whatever and then it was this other dude who is a friend of mine um who uh you know we were we had like just been a little we had been off and on like very casual no no commitments i I actually went home with him <laughs> and, and left the other dude at the house. Wait, you left the other dude at the house. Community had fun in the bathroom, and then you went home with the casual dude. Yes, wow, that's tough. You know what? That's pivot, how you end it. That's you know what? I'm done. The job is over. <laughs> Complete. I was having like, all that ass, and I'm out. I mean, I was like, I just I need to know the nigga just, at the house. What happened? <laughs> So he curse you out the next where did he go? Did you go home when he was sleeping in your bed? Like No, he eventually left because he waited on me for like four hours. <laughs> did and you I, not come in? And I never I just completely forgot. What about lie did you it. tell? I didn't tell no lie. I, was, I didn't tell him where I was. I was just like, oh my bag. I just the party got too good. Like I mean, I don't I don't know. I'm but sorry, your D was forgettable. I forgot to come home. But we Shit. had never even that, that we nothing had ever happened even between the thought us. was forgettable. <laughs> It was just, you know, I guess I just, um, uh, there was a d- development. <laughs> he, le- he left the vibe. It, uh, he, right. Shiny and, things when they're present. You're like, this is more exciting. He left yeah, the vibe, you know? And it, yeah. I mean, and it was, it was my last night in this place. I was uh, hopping on the plane literally the next day. You know what? You're going to blow it up with a bang. Just That's sh- what I say. And then uh, you, for a while, I used to uh, joke with a friend of mine, like, I can't show my face around there for like a good Girl, niggas Three, don't have no, years. no problem showing their face. <laughs> no, they have no problem. They show right up, yeah. banged everybody in the party. No problem. <laughs> so that was that. You know, probably. Is- top three most trifling things I've probably ever done. That was pretty good. Sure it was three. Okay. Um, right, you know. So there's I like my that. Hurry I do love that. It <laughs> makes me want to like send somebody to my house. I'll be right there. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, it just sounded Maybe. cool it to bossy, do. Yeah. yeah, like it felt like, okay, this is cool to do. And I had the intention because, you know, he and I had been flirting for a while. And then it just, I was like, oh, crap, I forgot about him. Wow. I feel like something that's something niggas do often. Like, yeah, go wait at the house, baby. I had to run some errands. Although, <laughs> you know, dudes are very, very particular about leaving you in their crib like that's if they don't true. know you know because i know true. some people are thinking like you would left a random dude up in your house i don't want to go into a dude's house alone i don't know that's dirty like did you wash your sheets like yeah it's, too, it's, it's more more questions i need to make sure you've been there before and made prepared <laughs> for me to enter right i was like no, i was staying in a little you know crappy apartment that with some um because it came furnished <laughs> Perfect. Like was it was okay? Steal the TV they gave me. Right, okay, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> right, so I'm good. <laughs> so anyway, uh, oh my god. Well, thank you for sharing. I thank you it. for coming on the show. I'm so happy you came. Thank you. This was um, this was a lot of fun. And uh, again, y'all just keep doing your thing. Not that I have to tell y'all how to do that. And I can't wait to read you all's book. <laughs> Can you divulge the title or no? A good I- mom's guide to making bad choices. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Perfect. We're going to tell you all the ways in which you can do that. <laughs> Guilt safely. Free. <laughs> Guilt free. Guilt free and safely. Amazing. Um, wait, where can everyone find your book? Everywhere, I'm Everywhere sure. Everywhere books are sold. Yes, there is an audio book recording. And of course, I'm encouraging people to order from black bookstores. Oh. A lot of them were hit very hard in the pandemic. And just in general, um, I think bookstores are just essential to community. Right? Bookstores and libraries. Those are... Um, essential community pillars for me. So, yeah, yes, it is available on Amazon and all that good stuff. But if you can, you know, hit up Mahogany Books or Uncle Bobby's or um, even if you have a local black bookstore near you, you can probably order online as well. Yes, I love that. And make sure you check Jamel's podcast out on Spotify. Mm -hmm. Make sure you check out the Black Girl Bravado. Shout out to our girls who are now exclusively on the Unbothered Network on Spotify. Um, anything else I'm, I'm missing? Uh, and also Sanctified, which is also... And Sanctified, and yes. Sanctified, and Sanctified. Uh, which is hosted by Deborah Joy Winans and Womanist Pastor LaVon Briggs. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. Amen. Um, and you know where to find us. Or if you don't, make sure you're watching us on YouTube. You can actually watch this episode on YouTube. If you click the link in this episode description, you can watch the full episode on YouTube. Check out our Patreon for bonus content. Um, we're going to Costa Rica, y'all. Are you coming? Did you get your fucking passport? We're your ticket? two months away, so we better hurry the fuck up. Make sure you go follow at the Good Vibe Retreat. Come to Costa Rica. You deserve a five day, all inclusive, amazing, incredible vacation. I promise you, you will not regret this shit. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.
Solo one.